States of Matter. Um, I'm going to keep it pretty simple. We're going to keep to your basic standard states of matter. Solid, liquid, gas. We're not going to go into plasmas. Um, I may talk about some of the more exotic forms later. But as a whole, we're going to stick with the big three. Just kind of the normal ones here. So, solids. Solids have a definite volume and shape. This means it doesn't change. You have a brick and it has a certain weight or a certain mass. Let me change that around. Mass. It has a certain mass and it has a certain shape and it takes up a certain amount of volume. If I take it to the moon, it's going to look exactly the same. Take it out in space, same. Take it into the ocean, the same. Like it's not going to change. It's a solid. All right? So the solids are in relatively fixed positions. They do move. They are going to vibrate back and forth because they do have kinetic energy. And so they are going to vibrate and they can somewhat move around a little bit in this. But you want to think kind of soldiers in a column. All right. And solids can have a variety of 3D structures that determines their properties. And if they're in a repeating structure, we call that crystalline. And there are so many different types. And I think that's really an AP chem or a college chem topic. Not necessary for high school. If they don't have any repeating structure, we call them amorphous. So something like a diamond and graphite have a repeating structure where the something like coal does not. Coal is amorphous. So liquids. Liquids are similar to that they have a definite volume. A gallon of milk is a gallon of milk, whether it's in a gallon jug, in a big bowl, or in a puddle on the floor. Its volume is still the same. Its shape, however, can change depending upon what you put it in. It can be gallon jug shaped, it can be bowl shaped, or it can be puddle shaped. Its shape can change, but its volume remains the same. So in a liquid, they're still close to each other, similar to a solid, but they slide around each other. That this guy can move over here and then slide over here and then he can be over here and then this guy can slide around here and they can move around and slide around each other, but they're always going to be kind of close to each other. Um, the way I like to think of this is um, if you've ever seen a group of middle school girls at the mall, you know, they kind of move around as a blob. Like their relative position to each other may change, but they never get more than like five feet away from each other. And they kind of always move as a group and, you know, and it just kind of flows and moves like that. That's how I think of a liquid. And so some liquids resist motion and we call that viscosity. So viscosity is a measure of a resistance to flow. And so the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more it's going to resist flow and the higher its viscosity will be. So think molasses, really thick motor oil. Those are things that are going to resist flow or you know, really thick syrup. You know, that they resist flow um, because their molecules are being held together more tightly and they don't want to flow around each other as easily. And that gives them what we call higher viscosity. But if you take any of those things and you heat them up, the molecules are there moving faster, and therefore it's easier for them to move, and flow increases, which lowers, means there's a lower viscosity. And that's just, I mean, viscosity is one of those things you need to know about, but it's not super, super critical. Same thing with surface tension. Um, that surface tension is caused by intermolecular forces holding the surface together. The strongest, stronger the forces, the stronger the tension. Water has an obviously high surface tension. If we had a pool of ethanol and we knew it wouldn't hurt you, chemically speaking, you could jump into that and you wouldn't hurt having a belly flop because there's very little intermolecular forces there holding you together and it wouldn't have much of a surface tension. And there, are, you know, and so we can do those kind of things to decrease surface tension. Moving on to gases. Gases can change their volume and their shape. You know, where solids have solid, solids have definite volume and shape, liquids have definite volume, gases have neither. Um, you know, like you never run through a part of a room that's empty of air because the air always expands to fill however much space it has. And so it does that easily. So gases experience little to no intermolecular forces. We generally assume none um, just to make things simpler. So each one it moves independently of others, kind of like if you let a group of kids loose on a playground, they just scatter to the four winds and you're trying to find your kids. And one's in the swings, one's on the slides, one's over there doing who knows what, and they're everywhere. And so that's kind of how gases are. 
And so we're going to deal a lot with gases on their own in the next chapter. All right, I want to talk about water specifically for a moment, just because water is a liquid, but water is unique and different enough to warrant its own conversation. It's also important because it makes up 60% of your body and 75% of the Earth's surface. So it is something we interact with a lot. Uh, it's, scientists are clear that without water, life would not exist. So the strong hydrogen bonding gives it very unique properties. So first of all, water is a liquid over an incredibly large temperature range. And it's a liquid over most of the temperatures on the Earth, from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, or 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a wide range. And so that allows for things to live over a wide range of the Earth without worrying about the liquid that makes up their bodies either evaporating or vaporizing or freezing. And that makes life a lot easier. All right. The hydrogen bonding also is part of what allows water to have that high specific heat. It allows it to absorb large amounts of heat without changing state. It also does it without really changing much temperature very rapidly. We talked about that last unit. Now, this is important. Our bodies are 60% water. Our, bodies, we, our body chemistry requires a very narrow temperature range. And because our body can absorb heat without changing temperature too quickly, or go out in the cold without getting too cold too fast, it allows us to live better. All right, ice is less dense than water, so ice floats. This is important for having things that live in water where it freezes. Because if ice were to sink, so let's say this is the top of your lake right here, what happens with water now is water freezes and it forms a layer on top of the lake because it floats. That actually acts as an insulator. So it could be like negative 20 degrees outside, but under the lake it's going to stay above freezing because that thick layer of ice acts as an insulator and allows everything else to stay above freezing, stay liquid water. You can have fish and other things staying alive down here. But if the ice sank to the bottom of the lake, the lake would freeze solid all the way through and no fish because they would all die. Okay, water has a high surface tension that allows things like capillary action. You know, if you've ever you know, had your finger pricked and they put that thin little glass tube, it's the surface tension that's pulling the blood up the tube. That's called capillary action. It's involved also in water transport in trees. All right, um, takes a lot of energy to vaporize water. That's why sweat is a cooling effect. Um, as the sweat is being evaporated off your body, it absorbs lots of heat from your body and evaporates off. Works really great in places other than Mississippi, where I live, where it's so humid that sweat can't evaporate and it just makes you feel hotter. And then water is sometimes referred to as a universal solvent. Not quite true. It can't dissolve anything, but it dissolves lots of things. And that's why our body chemistry is water-based. Um, biochemistry is water-based because that is how things behave. Things dissolve in water and it gives us a lot of abilities. All right, so that's our states of matter. Next lesson, we'll look at how we change between them.